tenure at the University of Southern California. He holds a Master of Science in Tissue Repair Wound Healing from the University of Wales College of Medicine and a PhD from the University of Manchester College of Medicine, where he was appointed visiting professor of medicine. He is founder and co-director of the Southwestern Academic Limb Salvage Alliance. He has produced more than 615 research papers in dozens of scholarly medical journals, as well as over 100 books or book chapters. He has won numerous awards. Uh, can I cut it a little bit short? Otherwise, it will take a long time. Uh, he was selected. Oh my God, as, yeah, you're already saying too much. <laughs> he was selected as one of the first six international wound care ambassadors and is the recipient of numerous awards and degrees by universities and international medical organizations, including the inaugural Georgetown Distinguished Award for Diabetic Limb Salvage. In 2008, he was the 25th and youngest ever member elected to the Podiatric Medicine Hall of Fame. He was the first surgeon to be appointed University Distinguished Outreach Professor at the University of Arizona. He was the first podiatric surgeon to become a member of the Society of Vascular Surgery and the first U.S. podiatric surgeon named Fellow of the Royal Society of Royal College of Surgeons, Glasgow. He is the 2010 and youngest ever recipient of ADA's Roger Picarero Award, the highest award given in the field. The floor is yours, sir. <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, thank you, Mehmet. After that, uh, after that uh, intro, you can uh, only be disappointed. So uh, buckle up for that. Uh, but uh, uh, anyway, it is, um, thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you guys uh, today. Thank you uh, for letting me play hooky um, uh, today clinically um, uh, from, uh, from my duties, but it's a pleasure to be with you. Um, and we're going to try to cover a, uh, Kind of a, a the length and breadth uh, of a topic uh, that you probably are largely ignore. I don't know why you wouldn't, um, but uh, hopefully we'll talk about something that is quite humble, but uh, uh, maybe connected to almost everything uh, uh, that many of us are doing, and hopefully find some areas where we can innovate. Uh, and I've been nothing but impressed uh, with my initial interactions with Terasaki. I was just telling Mehmet I'm embarrassed uh, that I hadn't known about it. Uh, until this past year when I was contacted by Johnson John and, and uh, Mohan uh, Akbari, who are uh, fellows within, uh, within Terasaki. But let's, uh, let's get rolling um, here. Uh, uh, you, you know, if you'd like any of these slides, um, we just ping me uh, 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 and um, I would just ask you to copy them, um, make them better and pay it forward. How does that sound? And we'll... Uh, uh, go from there. But what we're going to be talking about is uh, uh, kind of a marriage of, of uh, doing efforts to try to lim limit limb amputation, uh, uh, not only in Southern California, but really worldwide. But I think what you're going to find in doing this in efforts in doing this from an engineering standpoint, from a medical surgical standpoint, from a, and from the science standpoint, and even innovation um, and and uh, uh, an industry standpoint, I think this is an enormously rich area that has been uh, largely ignored over many, many years. Um, and and I'll, I'll just get started with this. Uh, so I, I, this is what I do. I'm a, I'm a foot doctor, if you will. And, um, you know, I, I guess I can think of uh, uh, two great gifts in working um, at the end of the body on this anatomic peninsula, if you will. The first one is is this is, you know, um, in this era of kind of hubris and chest thumping, I can't think of anything that is more of an expression um, of humility um, than working on the foot. And it doesn't matter um, where you live, what your religion is, even when you lived, uh, it crosses borders, religions, time, ethnicities, all of this. It is a deep expression of humility to look after someone's feet. And that's one gift. And the other one is if you're working out at the end of the body, where a lot of people have largely ignored things, you're on this sort of anatomic peninsula, if you will. Um, and, you know, my father used to tell me, um, son, the best gift you can give anyone besides your love is, is perspective. And, and I think that's true. And you get a great gift of perspective working out at the end of the body. And so our team are working on everything from spread on and spray on skin to the first gene therapies, 
in uh, tissue repair and wound healing to uh, epidemiology and uh, uh, large sample size collections to wearable robots uh, and everything in between. So it's a really exciting time to be working in this area. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll discuss some of that. But let's start again, um, maybe just looking back a little bit. This is a video. Um, this is the first video of any surgery ever caught on tape. Check this out. This is Professor Von Bergman. And I have uh, actually gave a lecture maybe about eight, 10 or 12 years ago at his uh, institute and now is now in Potsdam. But this is about 120 uh, two or 123 years ago here now him cutting off that leg and you see that leg going somewhere and it was so rapid and you see this looks like the nurse she's upset that he's not wearing gloves but she's happy that he turned the room over so fast but the, the learn the learning point that's happening here is not that this amputation was done so quickly it's that this person here that we can't see him or her having her, his or her leg off 120 plus years ago probably had a better outlook on life than someone in Los Angeles or in North America or anywhere around the world having his or her leg off. And, and I think that stinks because I think there's a lot we can do about that uh, to make a difference collectively uh, um, in science and engineering and certainly in a, a my humble area in, in, in medicine. And so let's talk about that. Let's look at a little bit of the data uh, to, uh, uh, to, to support why we should care about this. Uh, then we're going after doing some of that, we're going to look at some of the efforts we've had to try to um, maximize how people move through the world. But first, the bad stuff, and then we'll get into the good stuff. So um, I don't need to tell everyone, uh, but I guess I will, that foot, foot complications are really ignored, but they're common, they're complicated, and they're costly. So in addition to being alliterative, what does that even mean? And let's look at these data. Um, if we look at maybe the 350 million people, in the United States, and we kind of zoom in now on these bubbles of demography, which are uh, overtaking us. We, there's maybe 10% of these patients now, 10% of these people have diabetes, so maybe 35 to, to 38 million people with diabetes. Half of them have the most generous definition of neuropathy. We'll talk about that in a minute. That's where they lose the ability to feel pain and they wear a hole in their foot, like we would wear a hole in a sock. And uh, about half have some element of peripheral artery disease in their extremities. That's just like coronary artery disease, but just further out into the body. Um, and if you have one, you likely have the other. And you see here, there's probably a few million people now in the United States living either with a foot ulcer, with severe peripheral artery disease, also known as CLTI, or just with limb loss. So it, it, relatively common. And, and look at these data. Um, we looked at the World Health Organization's global uh, burden of disability and global burden of disease um, data set um, several years ago. And now I can't believe 2018 was already several years ago. And we did that in 2018 and 2020. And it was pretty crazy. We didn't realize this when we looked at it. We didn't believe it at first. But we, when you disaggregate diabetes uh, or diabetic foot complications from the rest of diabetes, check it out. By itself, it is its own top 10 condition. So uh, it, it's, that's crazy because there's plenty of people talking about many of these other things that commonly afflict people uh, worldwide. And this is only getting more common, not less common. Let's continue with this. Uh, uh, from that same data set, if you look uh, at every sing, uh, single part of the world in every single age group, uh, it's not usual that we say every single, but this is every uh, age group, you see these problems now increasing not decreasing over the last uh, generation. Um, and this is becoming more significant, not less significant in terms of its, 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 com its how complicated and costly it is. But what about um, in places where there may be some elements of, of amputations reducing? Now there's some debate on whether that's actually happening, but there are some data um, uh, in the United States and, and in France and other countries that there may be a leveling out of, of amputations um, at least in the last decade, and now it looks like it's increasing. Well, let's just say it is uh, uh, reducing. Even when that's happening, we're seeing an increasing uh, incidence in foot ulcers, diabetic foot ulcers. These are the problems that precede amputations. So it would be almost like if we were talking about cancer, and we will in a minute, uh, maybe a, a, a generation ago, there, there started to be epidemiologically um, 
fewer and fewer proportionally cancer deaths, as it were, uh, per person per year, but more cancer. So that's probably similar to what we're seeing now in this largely ignored problem at the end of the body, which is often silent until it's not. And you see here, just developing a wound, a diabetic foot ulcer, that's what a DFU is, just, have it, just developing one increases your risk of dying that year by at least two and a half fold. It's actually more in some studies, less in others. So there you are, uh, common, complicated, and costly. And you also see here, there's a nine fold greater risk for death um, who, in people that have healed their wound. We're gonna talk about that as well uh, in, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in a few minutes as well. So uh, at, in addition to this, uh, there's a lot of complexity here. I look at these data. We looked at every single um, outpatient visit um, in the United States, it's, uh, about five and a half billion of them. I, I know a trillion is the new billion, but a billion is still a lot. It's basically every outpatient visit for five years in the United States. And, and what we found was remarkably that these problems, these humble problems in the foot were, I think we can safely say, in terms of risk for going into the emergency department or inpatient admission, or for referrals or other things that we think are elements of complexity, I think it's at least as complicated as the things that we know about and care about in a public health sense, like being obese or having heart failure or having cancer or having uh, a, a, a cerebral or cardiovascular disease. So there you go, That's it's com common uh, and complicated, uh, but uh, what's another way to look at it? Well. Here you are. Um, uh, if you want to look at the best available data we have now, about every second, someone around the world develops a, a diabetic foot ulcer. About half of those get infected. Um, about 20% of those end up in hospital, which is why now around the world, there's an amputation um, every 20 um, seconds. And every 20 seconds, we think this is something that is preventable. Um, and we can make a difference for almost all these patients. And, but we'd like to say that time's up for this. And I think there's a, there's, there's a way to improve this. And it, it mandates that we get together in engineering and medicine and science, uh, in industry and academia and practice, uh, and with patient care groups and policymakers to make this happen. And, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that um, over the next, uh, the, the next few minutes. But before we do that, let's continue with a little more bad before we get in with the good. Um, and um, so it's not fair to compare one terrible thing to another, but let's do it because the bottom line is um, very few people here care much about diabetes and even fewer care about feet, frankly. Um, but everyone, all of us care about cancer. We've all had family members who've succumbed or are, who are, or are living with uh, cancer or have uh, su survived cancer. Um, so let's, let's just as an academic exercise, do this, even though it's not fair to compare a terrible problem to another one. So let's look at these. These are data. I left this in here. It's already 10 years old, but, uh, look at these, uh, data it's this problem now is more expensive. And, and by the way, I left this in because it's, this is the most conservative numbers we have. The lower extremity complications of diabetes are now more expensive than the five most expensive cancers in the United States. And this is true in the National Health Service in England, it's true in the UK, it's true in uh, Health Canada as well. It's extraordinary when you look at these data. In addition to that, more importantly, let's look at five-year mortality. So people that have had these sorts of complications, like a, like a wound, like a, a partial foot amputation or significant vascular disease or a major amputation, these problems are at least as bad as a bad form of cancer. And we would never think of withholding therapy on someone with breast cancer or when col with colon cancer or with lung cancer, but it happens all the time in people with diabetes and foot problems. There's a pervasive, pervasive nihilism where you say, where people say, oh, Ms. Garcia, she has that wound. She's just going to get another one. Why don't we just chop the leg off and be done with it? And you know, for some people, that's, that may be the best thing. Um, but not for most people. And I think the data are very strong to, to support that. And we've looked at some of that already. We'll look at more later. But uh, that's kind of where we are right now um, as we move uh, forward. But let's, let's uh, uh, look at this as well. If we look at quality of life, 
um, the, the health related quality of life is, is equivalent to someone who has not just cancer, uh, but recurrent breast cancer, if you look at these data. And now let's look at it a slightly different way. Uh, there are many efforts, um, not only by our unit, but many other units around the world to heal these wounds, but are they really healed? Um, and uh, in a relatively recent uh, uh, um, paper, we, we looked at this in, using the best available data from our group and from others, um, not only at foot ulcers, but at their recurrence. So let's just do that. Let's look at this. Um, so how do people develop foot ulcers? So it's really a mechanical, this is an engineering problem uh, that, that may have some elements of engineering solutions along with policy solutions and other kinds of solutions. And, uh, uh, um, but let's look at this. So people develop diabetes and then they develop neuropathy. And neuropathy has sort of three flavors, if you will. There's the sensory neuropathy, which allows you to wear a hole in your foot and not feel it. Uh, there's motor neuropathy, which causes the large muscles, uh, for what happens to the small muscles in the hand or the foot also, they atrophy. Um, and so that allows the big muscles in the leg to overpower the little muscles. And so you get, I don't know the method, the medical word for jacked up, but you sort of get jacked up. You get, you get to get deformities in the, in the, uh, uh, in the foot, which then uh, makes you have higher force per unit area and pressure which requires less cycles of stress before you develop a callus and then a wound. And then you also get autonomic neuropathy where your skin uh, becomes less visco viscoelastically robust and you can, your skin becomes more like a cracker and less like a tortilla, I guess, to use a culinary analogy since we're almost at lunch for you. Uh, but uh, so that's what happens here. And then you, people develop calluses and then those calluses uh, 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 through re repetitive trauma, uh, uh, you have bleeding into them, and then they ultimately develop in a wound. Those get infected, they get deeper, and and then ultimately an amputation. And vascular disease also plays a significant role in helping those wounds either form or not heal. So that's kind of the big, the whole enchilada here um, for how we can look after these things in many ways, and we can detect problems as well. But after healing patients, and there are ways to heal them by appropriately surgically debriding them, by putting appropriate um, technologies on them. We don't have time to talk about many of the different wound healing therapies we have, but we can in the Q&A and maybe in subsequent chats. Um, but let's look at what happens after healing. About four in 10, 40% of these folks are going to have another wound um, at one year. It's about two thirds at three years and give or take three quarters at five. So, um, you know, maybe we can't heal anyone. And maybe we're looking at this the wrong way. Uh, and uh, uh, because, uh, ladies and gentlemen, recurrence isn't co only common in this patient population because of this non-communicable disease and the loss of sensation and the recurrence rate, recurrence is likely. So if the foot is a little bit like uh, cancer in diabetes, then maybe when people are healed, maybe they're not healed, maybe they're in uh, remission. And uh, this seems like just a turn of phrase, but I assure you, it's not because this is so important, this idea, because it's true in every non-communicable disease that we're dealing with. And even though we've been through this massive pandemic, it's people with non-communicable diseases uh, whose lives are often cut short with, uh, with this pandemic. So it's really not the infectious diseases, it's the non-infectious ones, things like diabetes, cardiovascular disease, uh, the cancer and things. But for this foot problem, it's, it, it's very, very apropos. And we use this term remission and we sort of coined it in talking to these patients because when you talk to your patient, you could say, you know, Ms. Jones, you've healed, but this is just like cancer. And you remember us talking about cancer, don't you? And you see her stiffen up and her husband in the corner stiffens up. Um, this problem can shorten your life for sure, but our goal is to get you moving. Uh, but the chances of you developing another wound over the next five or 10 years is almost certain. Our goal is to make that wound as uncommon and as uncomplicated as possible and to keep you out of the hospital and keep you moving. And then you start seeing um, maybe uh, lighten up a little bit and they think, well, okay, there's some things that can be done. If we need to, we'll operate on you to change the way your foot hits the ground or give you better blood flow uh, this way or that. Uh, we'll get you the right shoes and insoles. This is the idea. Um, and so this is the important thing because 
This is logarithmically increasing in prevalence now, these patients in remission, and it's super important. But what's cool now is entire uh, health system are now adopting this idea of remission um, and developing units based on it. It's not just our unit at USC and across uh, uh, our Department of uh, uh, Health Systems here in, in Los Angeles, uh, uh, in the county, but it's, uh, this is from the NHS in Scotland and, and in, the, in the rest of the UK. Uh, you see here now that they're using this whole idea and we're re-importing this and trying to improve it again. So it's pretty great. It's like NAFTA for feet. Free Toes, North American Free Toes Alliance. So this is pretty great, but, but, uh, but you're seeing now that there are ways that we can make a difference. And we're gonna to touch on that in about two, two minutes. But before we do that, let me just show you this because it'll help define the rest of the few minutes we have together. Uh, but uh, if we look here at the things, the three things that lead to recurrence, it's, it's neuropathy, that's what this is. It's uh, peripheral artery disease. We talked about that. And it's the presence of a pre-ulcerative lesion. And what is a pre-ulcerative lesion? It's this simple callus, this humble callus, and this thing even has bleeding into the callus. And, and you see here, looks like with this guy, who's a patient of ours, looks like one piggy has already gone to market, uh, unless there's unless he has like a wicked hammer toe. Is that even a, a word, wicked? Yeah, that uh, we can't see, uh, but causing but uh, causing this problem. But you see this. This is how do you describe this to the patient as a callus? You could do that, but that's kind of boring and they're just going to forget it. Maybe you could just, if the foot is a little like cancer in diabetes, then maybe a callus is a little like a breast lump. And, and they understand that. Um, and now this problem, maybe instead of being 11th on their 10 most important things in their life, maybe it becomes ninth, right? And that's great because now you've helped move this forward and ultimately keep a few more legs on a few more bodies with all of this. So that was kind of the first section of talking about why this is a big problem. And, 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 but there's a lot we can do um, about this. Um, in addition to putting together interdisciplinary teams, and we don't have time to talk about that, but there's tons of data on that from our group and from others. Um, how do we prevent severe recurrence if we can't prevent all recurrence? And it's really, if you think about it, it's, it's, a, um, um, it's just an algorithm. It's an equation really. It's, it's not even three variables, although I'm gonna put three in here. It's really two, but but it's in the face of neuropathy, because all of these patients will develop this loss of feeling, you really have two things that we can manipulate mechanically or externally through shoes and insoles or internally uh, through surgery with pressure um, and, uh, or physical therapy, or if you're British, physiotherapy. And then the other variable is activity. Um, and we used to not be able to measure activity, but now of course, um, this is something that we can measure really well. It's astonishing. Uh, uh, the things that used to cost me $5,000 a patient for, per grant for the uh, accelerometers in the 90s and early 2000s are almost free now. It's so wonderful to see. Uh, but, it, but really, it's, it's an imbalance of pressure and activity and we, that creates these little wounds that become big wounds. And we have to bring that activity and that pressure imbalance back into balance. That's it. And we could do that a variety of ways. So we'll talk about that now for the last part of our chat. So this is one of my oldest slides. I think I wrote this maybe in the eighties or there should be a, like a sepia tinged kind of uh, a cracking on this uh, slide. But I used to think that um, uh, we could dose activity like we dose a drug if we can only measure it, right? Um, because with, with drugs, um, you have what's called a peak and a trough, a peak and a trough, too high, and then you get to this peak and you have toxicity, too low, and you don't get the benefit of the drug. Uh, same thing with activity and diabetes, too high, and the person develops a wound, uh, um, too low, and they don't get the cardiometabolic benefit or the feel-good benefit or the quality of life benefit from being active. But maybe we can ease them into activity. If we can only measure it, uh, we can maybe manage it. And this was the thought back in the day. And now it's really happening. Um, if you look here, uh, these are, this is a beautiful video from uh, Dan Lieberman's lab in Boston at Harvard. Uh, but you see this beautiful example of uh, balance with, uh, with the foot, right? I mean, it's just 
when it's working right, it's pretty great. It's like anything that's high performance. But the, unfortunately, with diabetes, most of what we see and we deal with is really um, um, out of balance. And our goal is to try to bring that into balance. But let me just show you this activity um, here. These are data already from 20 years ago, uh, where we had in the early days of what people now call wearables. We put uh, wearables on patients and those that recurred, it wasn't that they took more steps, although sometimes they did. It was really that they had too much variability in that activity. So it was the coefficient of variation of the activity um, that caused the ulcer. So they could be someone that would be sitting in a chair and a sofa having healed a wound and then all of a sudden jump off the sofa and run to the mall because they forgot a birthday present for their uh, grandchild. That, and then they come back with a wound because they took five times more activity in two hours than they often in a, do an entire day. Um, and if only we can measure that, we could help manage it. And the cool thing is now we're, we, we can. Why? I mean, this is from uh, one of my former uh, mentees, now one of my really close friends, Bijan Najafi, uh, and his uh, lab. This is one of our mutual postdocs back there wearing a smart uh, a shirt and a smart pendant, but we can we can look at activity now. It looks like an ECG for your life. And we can follow this with a great deal of precision, which is really exciting, like we could never before. And this is getting better and better. But what's cool now is we could take those data, um, even just from a phone or from, a, from a, a, just a Fitbit or a watch, um, and we can now enter in a formula that people can use to ease them into activity um, and uh, potentially give them a personalized activity regime to, so they could dose their activity like they dose their insulin, if you will. And we're gonna look at other parts of this equation in a little bit. Well, I guess uh, everyone has been caught doing a selfie every now and then. We're also navel gazing and solipsistic, but maybe there's a way to do this uh, in a way that helps our patients. And what about a foot selfie? So this is a thing now. I get so many, in fact, I've just gotten one. Uh, I get so many uh, you know, Facebook messages and texts from patients or p uh, p other people around the world sending pictures of their feet. And uh, one of my uh, our medical students, uh, Mark Swerlow, wanted to try to systematize this several years ago when he was uh, initially a first year student. And uh, so we used... Uh, I think it was AWS uh, server, and we just had patients' information all get collated uh, up into one key area, uh, and then we and then we looked at it consistently at the same time. So we have what we call foot selfie rounds now every week at 7 a.m. on uh, on Monday, um, and not a day goes by where we don't stop a hospitalization. From it's so simple, we can get through 100 patients or more super rapidly. And this is entirely uh, 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 manual. Um, of course, we're working with friends of ours on uh, what's called the Diabetic Foot Grand Challenge, which has been funded in part by NVIDIA, where we wanna identify using an AI-based Sherpa, a wound before it actually happens within 10 seconds autonomously. That's the grand challenge. Uh, that has uh, been doing pretty well, but I think there's a lot of work that can happen in this area. It's super exciting. But you see this guy who just sent in a photo and he's already has an amputation, a partial uh, foot amputation here, uh, but he developed uh, a little area here that was pre-ulcerative that we were concerned about. And we ended up having him in and stopping this thing from becoming a blister and an ulceration. Um, uh, anyway, the last, uh, maybe uh, uh, let's just say 10 minutes of our chat, if that, um, uh, I'll start with, I just want to talk about two of my mentors. These are two of them. We should all honor our mentors, right? Uh, who are, uh, and uh, this is uh, Professor Paul Brand, um, and uh, this is Professor Andrew Bolton. Uh, but uh, uh, Paul um, grew up uh, initially in England and then spent a lot of time in South Asia, in, in Valor, in India, um, uh, uh, working with missionary parents. And he worked uh, as a young uh, trainee and then a young surgeon uh, uh, in, in a leprosy, as they call them leper colonies at the time, but in, a, uh, in, in South Asia, in, in India. And he actually discovered a lot of what we now know, which is that it's not some act of God that causes these problems in leprosy, it's neuropathy. And it's the same problem in, uh, uh, in people with diabetes. In fact, it's funny because my 
one of my fellows, Neil Trivedi, right now is uh, in our leprosy clinic. Leprosy still exists, believe it or not. And we have uh, the largest leprosy clinic in the United States at Los Angeles County USC Medical Center. And he's actually attending that right now. So we can learn a lot from that in diabetes. Um, and, uh, uh, and Professor Bolton, if his, he's the king of the insensitive, food, this is sort of the crown prince. Uh, and uh, he uh, uh, took a lot of this and uh, ran with it in diabetes about a generation ago. And I sort of carry their bags for them. I don't carry his bags anymore. He, he died uh, in uh, 2002, but he, he was a light packer. This one is more high maintenance. But Professor Brand back in the day uh, said this. It was really an engineering thing. It, it was that wounds will heat up before they break down. And if you want to sound smart, and by the way, who doesn't want to sound smart? I'm trying and failing, but there's still hope for you. What you can do is, if you're talking about any sort of physical system and any chronic disease, just take a sip uh, of whatever you're drinking. And uh, if you're doing a curbside with your buddy outside of his uh, office, just take a sip and just sh shake your head and say inflammation and, and then walk away and you'll be right. It doesn't matter what you're talking about. <laughs> you can be talking about any matrix in, uh, in medicine, um, especially though with the diabetic foot, because we can detect these problems and you can build entire systems to detect them. So check this out. I mean, we use this frequently. Uh, this is just from our clinic. This is just a FLIR device. These guys are in Santa Barbara, but this is just a little dongle that goes onto an iPhone, but we do much more sophisticated than this. And you can see here um, on the left, uh, these, the significant difference in uh, inflammation because these wounds will heat up before they break down. And, and we can identify this and maybe we can dose the activity uh, like we dose a drug in this case. And Paul Brand was right. This is a study we did about 15 years ago. And we found that people's wounds before they become a wound can get hot um, sometimes a week in advance from this study, but even weeks in advance from other studies. It's amazing. Um, and we can detect this early and it's great because we can attack it. And uh, with one of our uh, uh, centers that I work at, our National Center uh, for Rehabilitation at Rancho Los Amigos, we've developed guidelines to dose that activity with our patients. We do it all the time with our patients and we give them little charts that they can use. You saw some of the stuff we give them before, but we give them a thermometer that they can buy online for $10 to dose their activity. Now there are many more active measures that are uh, that are even cooler and better. This is one of them. Uh, this is a uh, smart bath mat developed in Boston by, uh, 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 by, uh, by a team. Um, and I helped them about 15 years ago with their pitch for the MIT 100K competition. And they were back then in 2007 and eight going up against people who wanted to be the next Facebook or Twitter. Uh, but what's crazy is feet ended up winning uh, uh, that MIT 100K back then. And this group has been really quiet, but they've ended up really helping a lot of people. And they have, they can identify uh, wounds now, not just hours in advance, but believe it or not, weeks in advance, which is crazy. Now, those are way oversensitive weeks in advance, but that receiver operating curve keeps improving. And it's super excited because these companies will come and they're going to go, but the technology is going to continue to is here to stay and it's going to continue to advance and the answer is in remote patient monitoring for all these patients this is a let's move from a bath mat to a, to smart socks there's all kinds of really cool things we could do here with with intelligent textiles uh, it, depending on how what kind of mechanism you're using if it's a a, a a fiber optic solution which we've used years ago uh, to just capacitors to many other kinds of sensors you can do a lot of cool things measure even joint angle and and motion to uh, uh, not only location, but also pressure. Um, but uh, some time ago, um, you know, look at these things. They're really ugly and they're very expensive. I think these used to be like $35,000 each. Uh, like, and if you lose one, cause you don't want to lose a pair of socks. So, and uh, you don't want to have a pair mismatch like we did. I actually did that. It's kind of a funny story, but uh, the point is these are ugly. Maybe they could be more beautiful. And, uh, so about five or seven years ago, uh, uh, Ran Ma, who was a biomedical engineer at, uh, at the time, I think she was at Northwestern, came up to us at one of our meetings. We have a DEF CON meeting, a diabetic foot conference. We're having it coming up later next month in, in, uh, in, in September. 
here in Los Angeles, actually. But she came up at one of our meetings and she said, you know, those things are ugly. We can make better ones and, and more attractive ones and we can make money on it. And I and, and we read something you wrote in the 90s about subscribing to your shoes and socks. And we're going to do that. And so she ended up doing it. Um, and uh, <laughs> they, uh, this little company turned into a not so little company because they uh, ended up going to the Consumer Electronics Show and competing against virtual reality and augmented reality. And uh, reality, reality ended up winning, and uh, they won the CES uh, uh, hardware battlefield back in uh, 2017. Then now, but those guys now are you know a proper entity, and they are giving socks now that have that have temperature uh, sensors to their to patients that can identify hotspots before they become hotspots. And all these companies now are, are are doing a lot of these things, which is super exciting. This is really cool. This is from my friend Zoltan Pataki. And I love Zoltan just because of his name, Zoltan. That what a beautiful name. And uh, the, so uh, here he is, uh, and uh, he's developed uh, a, uh, a smart uh, uh, shoes, which have a, a little insole that have a, that could get out of its own way, like a little shock absorber. And uh, what we've what we've thought about doing is using that, and we've made insoles now that have a. Um, shape memory alloy solution. We, we don't have time to talk about this now, but if you hit that with a little energy, it can deform and offload an area. And we would like to make ultimately like a closed loop system. We was talking to Mehmet about something like that before too, where you can identify a hotspot and then offload that area and protect it in real time. And the only thing that's in the way now is battery power, but that's getting so much less expensive and the form factors are so much more elegant and even regenerative capacity is really exciting. So that's Yet another thing that's pretty cool. Let's so let's let's move from smart insoles, sort of bath mat to socks to insoles. Let's keep moving up the body, uh, but all these different things are a little bit like smoke alarms. If you if you, if you think about it, the things that identify the hot spot, that's your smoke alarm. Uh, the, but then, the, if you think about uh, the smoke alarm, uh, you also need a fire department, right? So, uh, you know, the fire department would be the institution like the clinicians, the nurses, the doctors, the therapists. But the other thing is, you know, you need a fire extinguisher as well. And what is that fire extinguisher? There's a lot of opportunity for innovation, maybe in mod modifying inflammation in these patients. And we don't have that necessarily yet, but we may have things to where uh, we can be putting all these things into play to affect change. If you want to talk about a kind of a grand unifying theory for recurrence, it would be something like this, having all of these different sorts of tools um, in an engineering sense uh, and an industry sense to affect change. And I think there's a way forward here and it's an exciting time, frankly. So buckle up on that area. We don't have time to talk about that in so much depth, but we certainly can as much as you want after this. So the final two bits, uh, you know, um, wearables are kind of passe. Um, what if we could, uh, uh, take wearables and marry them with um, injectables. So this is a thing now. It's pretty cool. Um, and uh, so, so uh, friends of ours uh, at a uh, a company called uh, uh, um, Profusa, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm just, I'll show you this. So this is Natalie Wisniewski at Profusa and coworkers, along with one of our former fellows uh, and residents, Miguel Montero, did the first human study where they injected little sensors uh, into patients. Um, and this is a sensor that just has, it, it, it's not even a sensor, it's, it, it's, uh, it's not active, it's passive, it just has a little hydrogel in there and you can excite it with a laser from a distance. So just because lasers, right? And the form factor for a laser can be quite small now. And, and so this has now happened in the operating room where you can identify an analyte like um, oxygenation, but also um, blood glucose and a lot of other things too. So you, the sky's the limit here, really, right? if you think about it from an engineering sense. So it's an exciting time in that area as well for implantable sensors. And I think people are going to have these sensors on them and in them. And the masters of the universe are going to be those that can bring all of this together in a kind of a biological Wi-Fi, kind of a Bi-Fi if you will, to get all of this to communicate with one another and to and to be able to be actionable, more importantly. So this is the final thing I'll show you. This is uh, used to be science fiction. It's not. Uh, this is just a PTFE, uh, a, a, a Gore-Tex uh, blood vessel. Uh, and you know, 
just like with wounds, when someone has had a surgery, especially vascular surgery, the clock is ticking and that's going to fail. They're in remission there. And either the patient's going to go down or the repair is going to go down. Um, and so nothing ruins a good surgery like follow-up. So why wouldn't it be cool if we could identify these patients and follow them up outside of the clinic rather than inside of the clinic? And that, uh, so imagine if we could look at hemodynamics inside of a blood vessel and check this out. It's pretty cool. So um, you'll see uh, this tool here now has the equivalent. Uh, it's not a Doppler, but it's the equivalent of that. Uh, looking at kind of a Reynolds number uh, or turbulent flow in a, uh, um, and uh, this can be paired on the back table in the operating room, or if you're British, the operating theater um, uh, with Bluetooth LE. And you can now identify uh, when there's turbulent flow ahead of time um, at home, uh, rather than doing it um, in uh, the hospital. So that is really, really exciting. And I think things like this, uh, may, when they can figure out uh, an economic model around these sorts of things, are going to become more and more uh, ubiquitous. And I think there's a lot of room for innovation here. Um, and uh, uh, it, it's such an exciting time to be uh, discussing this. And actually I'm helping to run this uh, center to stream healthcare in place uh, with colleagues of mine to really just because of this. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm gonna conclude with this uh, just by, uh, I, I think I put the video in by, by, by request actually. So when I was a kid, um, I, uh, I still feel like a kid, um, but I, uh, I used to play, I played soccer or football. I played soccer all the way through university and, you know, um, I was a goalie. Um, and you know, if you're a goalie, it's like the opposite. It's the least sexy thing in the world, right? The sexy, uh, uh, striker, he or she is up in front and they can take, you know, 20 shots and miss 19 and they're the hero, right? Um, the same ratio does not work necessarily for the goalkeeper. And, uh, but um, I always felt comfortable there. And I saw this video and it kind of put it all together for me. So I'm gonna share it with you. Oh, there it is. Yeah, look at this. <laughs> anyway, so when I saw this video, I fell down laughing. I thought to myself, man, that's me. Uh, it actually isn't me, but it feels like me, not in the goal anymore, God knows, but in the clinic, uh, kind of, uh, looking dumb like usual, but somehow being in position to, uh, to help and maybe make a save now and then. And, uh, I thought immediately when I saw the video and thought of that analogy of this great quote from not Denton Cooley, but Mason Cooley, the aphorist, he said this back almost exactly a hundred years ago. And, in uh, 1920, he said, if you position yourself well enough, circumstances will, will do the rest. And I believe that. I believe if we come together as a family, um, scientists, engineers, physicians, sci uh, uh, surgeons, uh, and uh, policymakers, um, I think we can affect change. And in my little area, this little humble area at the end of the body, uh, maybe we can keep a few more legs um, on a few more bodies by working together. Cause I think that's what we all deserve. Uh, whether we have diabetes or not, no matter what our health and uh, no matter what our age and help our patients move through the world a little better. Mehmet and Mr. Chair, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for this great talk, Professor Armstrong. It was very entertaining as well as informative. A um, couple uh, questions uh, regarding the, the device uh, devices and the, the clinical aspect. What devices do you see are emerging? You know, you, the latest thing you said is the injectables. Yeah. Uh, what do you want to monitor and where do you think is going forward? Yeah, well, I think, um, well, there are people now at Terasaki that are talking about looking at, uh, um, uh, they're talking about looking at, and it, you know, Mosin, uh, um, along with, you know, Johnson, when he was talking to us, but Mosin has been looking at, uh, 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 you know, volatiles, you know, that's not dissimilar to a fashion to where you could be assessing volatiles like you do uh, uh, for the uh, for the bomb check going through TSA. That's the same sort of idea. I think something like that did not have to be internal. That could be immediately external. And that would be a beautiful form factor. And that's not being done just yet, although people are talking about it and there's real work going on, even at your uh, institution. Um, for the um, intelligent sensors, 
Um, I think that there's a lot going on now. We haven't had time to talk about it with epidermal electronics and maybe some of those communicating with some of the um, uh, internal uh, sensors that may just be very, very simple and dumb right now that you can sort of just ping uh, to determine uh, 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 certain analytes. But the key analytes that we're looking at right now uh, include uh, um, the most common includes oxygen, um, glucose, uh, but also uh, you know if you're if you're having uh, a, a you know you might you may want to look at things like a, an acidosis and things of that nature too, where you could uh, we could look at lactate. Um, there's a lot of other options, but some of those internal things don't necessarily need to be internal either. I mean, I think the internal um, getting internal costs a lot of money for these companies uh, right now in terms of not just not the device, but all of the regulatory stuff. So, so I think you can get away with a lot of external stuff as well. But I think there's a lot of work going on in both of those areas that's super exciting. Um, and we're really, you know, here in, in Southern California, but really right in the middle of a lot of that. It's, it, there's a lot going on. Super fun. Thank you. Um, regarding diabetic foot ulcers, the basic question, are they chronic wounds? How long does it take to heal them? So an average uh, diabetic foot ulcer can take months to heal um, if it's not, a, or even never heal, if it's not, um, if it's not treated um, with good basic. So there's two things you have to do. The, you have to take something off and then you have to put something on. So the thing you take off is you, you have to take off what's not viable and you have to surgically clean the wound or debride it. It's called debridement. Um, and then you also have to take off the weight. You have to sp uh, uh, spread force out over a large unit area that's called offloading. And we have a R01 that's looking at smart devices to do that. Um, so that's number one. But in the face of uh, an absent, any infection and absent any vascular disease, those wounds about between 70 and 90% will heal at 12 weeks. However, you add in vascular disease, you add in infection, and that proportion changes, the, uh, the weeks increase, and uh, uh, it de just depends on the level of, of disease. And we, we actually measure this using, a, we've had several classifications that we've developed over the years, but the most common one we use now is called, uh, and I know I talked to the guys at Teras Terasaki about this when they came over recently, but it's, it's called Wi-Fi, and, and it's just ordinal variables for wound, ischemia, that's blood flow, and foot infection, Wi-Fi. And you can just have an ordinal scale of zero through three to predict outcomes based on each one of those. Um, and it could be very, very helpful for predicting healing and for predicting what we call limb threat um, and also for applying resources. Thank you. Uh, people wanna avoid amputations. Is there any hope for early diagnostics for diabetic wound healing? Yeah, um, so the uh, that's a, a, a great question. I, I think uh, the there's th there are any number of if we're talking about well, let's talk about very quickly about diagnostics and theranostics in wound healing itself. There uh, right now that is a massive area, uh, a massive unmet need right now. Um, there, but I think now there's more and more interest in developing. Um, tools that can identify inflammation, like look at matrix metalloproteases in a wound, looking at um, uh, bacterial, bacterial proteases or other chemokines or cytokines to predict if the wound has too much inflammation in it that needs to be um, intervened on to heal. So there's a, a, that, that area is very rich right now for innovation and for novelty, no, number one. So that's just for the chronic wound for early detection to where you can use maybe a more advanced wound therapy early on if you need to, but not if you don't need to, um, because if you're just throwing an expensive product into a wound and it's filled with proteases, it's going to get chewed up and people spend billions of dollars every year on that. Um, and that's why having companion diagnostics is super important on the, um, on the, Early diagnosis, yes. Um, identifying neuropathy early on um, could stop everything upstream. Um, however, 
what right now it only appears that we have methods to slow down neuropathy, not to completely reverse it just yet, but keeping people in better glucose control and lipid control may have promise there. Although there are some, some mechanical tools that may improve sensation transiently. There's some stochastic uh, resonance insoles, believe it or not, that may uh, improve that a bit. There, there's a lot of little things that may show promise there to, to improve, improve sensation, to improve protection. On top of that, you have all the other things we talked about, thermometry, which is very promising, that, uh, it, uh, and uh, activity monitoring. Thank you. You mentioned the value of reducing var variability in activity. Are there any devices or approaches that you find particularly helpful in guiding patients to gradually ease back into activity during wound remission? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, the, the, what we do for our patients is this now. Um, the, we, take, um, uh, we will take their activity now and we, and almost all, believe it or not now, almost all of our patients have a smartphone or will, are willing to buy one now if we tell, or, 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 or just have a, or we're gonna get a Fitbit or we just give them one now because we have so many studies going on. Um, in fact, I'll just tell you one of my wonderful uh, uh, partners here, Ritika Chattervedi, she used to be with uh, the Rand Corporation and now she's uh, um, at our Schaefer Center for Health Policy. It has a study called American Life in Real Time or a Lear. And she's strapping um, these wearables on people now and just following them, people that wouldn't normally get it. So we give them a tool to count activity. Then we uh, have some of their activity, hopefully while they're healing. And then we have them move themselves into uh, activity zones uh, maybe 1,000 steps a day, up to 5,000 steps a day after they've had a, after they've had a wound. But we have them check then um, their feet um, once or twice a day using a simple thermometer, which you can just buy on Amazon now for $10. Uh, that tool is okay. I mean, it's probably good enough for a lot of uh, a lot of things. But that is like a I think it's like the early days of glucose of glucometry in the early eighties um, where, you know, you had tools uh, that could measure glucose, but they were inelegant. Uh, there are now more and more elegant solutions like the ones I was showing you, like the socks and like the bath mat um, that you can use and some other tools where we can dose activity and identify hotspots and people can back off that activity if they identify a hotspot. And then we have them tell us. We also have people enrolled in this foot selfie program where we have them send pictures um, of their feet. Um, and then we just go through a lot of those at scale. Uh, I mean, I don't, I wouldn't call what we're doing at scale, uh, but because we're doing it just for fun, um, in our own one unit, but I think there are efforts underway. And I think that's a place maybe Terasaki could also help to create AI based Sherpas to sort of assist us in identifying signatures of, um, that are visual based on just the regular pictures and also hyperspectral or just regular thermometry uh, to identify risky areas. Um, and that's a very exciting area, uh, frankly. I'm, I'm very excited about that. Thank you. You mentioned heat as a marker. What are your thoughts on using pH as a marker for wound monitoring? Yeah, pH is a great tool. It's unbelievable. It's literally a litmus test and yet people don't use it. And there are a lot of data. On there, I, I would uh, I see most and ask that question. It's a great question, and uh, I uh, um, I think that's a rich area to, uh, to to look at. And there's a um, I know that there are people that have some IP there, but not enough actually. And imagine just putting that into an intelligent uh, matrix or to an intelligent sensor, um, or and marrying these things. You definitely could do that. Thank you. Final question: What are your thoughts about gene delivery or gene editing in diabetic wound healing? Yeah, well, these are great questions. So, so um, by the way, even if these weren't good questions, I would say good questions. <laughs> these are great questions. <laughs> but, but so um, there, there are. Uh, 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 so we are right now. I'm, I'm the principal investigator on the first ever uh, gene therapy study in um, in people with neuro ischemic wounds, where we are injecting. We're taking a little naked plasmid, and we're delivering it into the muscle. 
uh, along the calf muscle. We're taking an MR angiogram and we're putting it along there and it's growing little baby blood vessels, theoretically improving flow. Uh, but that is, um, that's now in phase two, just finishing phase two, touch wood, there are no safety signals. Um, but uh, the, uh, that uh, um, is one area that where there have been several um, efforts before this to, to, to affect change. And I think that's going to happen. I think something like that's going to happen over the next couple of years for uh, CRISPR Cas9 and other types of uh, uh, gene editing uh, regimes. Uh, you know, this is something we were, have been very interested in since, you know, uh, 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 Professor Doudna talked about this uh, team, uh, you know, from Berkeley. Uh, I think that um, there could be ways to edit out um, aspects of people who maybe have itchy um, pro-inflammatory triggers, um, understanding those pathways. We are in the dark ages right now um, uh, with, uh, in terms of understanding those things and we have to climb out of that. The only way to do that is to measure what we're managing right now. And I think we're getting better at it, but I think that's an area where Terasaki can help lead. Well, that's all the questions I have. Thank you so much. Come visit us or something. If you have time. Uh, Oh, I very much look forward. Uh, uh, absolutely, positively. And by the way, same thing for you guys. I know a couple of you uh, intrepid adventurers already have, but you're so welcome, really. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you so much. Okay, guys, take care and be well. Ciao, ciao.